morning. It's Tuesday, September 15th, 803. And this is a joint meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee and the Senate Ag Committee to address an uh, outstanding issue that's been with us for a few years. So um, I don't know who wants to, in terms of context, um, who can set up the meeting in terms of what did we try to do before and in what way did that fall short? And so what do we have left to do? I think, I think Michael probably would be the best person to, to back up. But before he starts, I just, this is Senator Starr. I would just say that uh, the, the fair, Addison County Field Days fair people, uh, a little history. Um, a group of people or a person donated a welcome center, a uh, new building to the fairgrounds, uh, Addison County Field Days rather. And uh, in, so the building was donated to the fairgrounds uh, or to the field days. And they decided they already had three bathroom systems that were set up on holding tanks and, and um, so they thought it would be really nice to put a modern uh, bathroom and wash uh, system, wash bay, uh, you know, so people could clean up after and everything in this new building. And so this is what started this process was that uh, that was when they applied for a holding tank, it was, it was, um, I guess it wasn't approved. It was determined that a, a leach field type system would best serve the, the situation environmentally. And it was going to cost so much that it was uh, prohibitive from, they, they couldn't do it. So then we got mixed up in it and, and I'll let Michael take off uh, from there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you uh, the context legally, including what you did two years ago. So I'm gonna share the screen and show you the statutory section 10 BSA 1979 on holding tanks. Um, just one second. All right. And um, hold on a second. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. So uh, there, as you all know, since you've worked on these issues before, uh, if you're going to put a wastewater system into the ground in Vermont, a new one, you need a permit from the Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Conservation. There is a section and statute that allows certain entities to use holding tanks instead of a septic tank or a leach field or other um, system. Uh, but the who can use the holding tank is limited. You'll see in 10 VSA 1979 subsection A that there's a section for allowing people that um, uh, when it, the building is publicly owned. Uh, but then you go down to B1, there's also a subsection that allows the secretary to approve the use of a sewage holding and pump out tank for existing or proposed buildings or structures that are owned by charitable, religious, or nonprofit organizations. So field days and, and other agricultural fairs are nonprofit organizations, but there are certain conditions that need to be met. One of those conditions was <laughs> on B1C, where the design flows do not exceed 600 gallons per day, or the existing or proposed building or structure shall not be used to host events on more than 28 days in any calendar year. That last phrase, where the proposed building or structure shall not be used to host events on more than 28 days in a calendar year. That was added two years ago by the General Assembly to address events like the agricultural fairs, specifically the Addison County Field and Fair Days. Um, 
So where the there's not going to be continuous yearly use or even significant use across several months, just 28 days in any calendar year. And that, that was added. But there are also other conditions that are required to get a holding tank permit under 10 BSA 1979. One of those is in B2, subdivision B2, where it says before constructing a holding tank, the applicant shall post a bond or other financial surety sufficient to finance maintenance of the holding tank for the life of the system, which shall be at least 20 years. So this is what you're going to be looking at today, this bond slash financial surety requirement. The issue here is that it's often difficult, if not, not possible for an applicant to get a bond or financial surety from a financial institution for a holding tank. Um, so this, this is being proposed to be struck as a requirement for those events that are held on no more than 28 days in any calendar year. Now, the reason that the financial surety provision is in there is, as the language says, to ensure the maintenance of the holding tank for the life of the system. But there's also another requirement in this section that requires that the, um, that the owner of a holding tank, it's subsection H, the owner of the holding tank shall maintain a valid contract with a licensed wastewater hauler at all times. The contract shall require the licensed wastewater hauler to provide written notice of the dates of pumping and volume of wastewater pumped. And so there is already a, a, another maintenance requirement under subsection H for the holding tank to be maintained under a valid contract with a licensed wastewater hauler. So, so that's the, the section. And so I'm gonna now share the screen. Can you see the screen now? Yeah. Yes. So this is the amendment and really um, most of this language is being provided for context. The specific change is gonna be in B2, which I just referenced. It's that financial surety requirement and it says, before constructing a holding tank, the applicant shall post a bond or other financial surety sufficient to finance maintenance of the tank for the life of the system, provided that a bond or other financial surety is not required for a holding and pump out tank for a building or structure that is not used to host events on more than 28 days in any calendar year. So just that, that financial surety isn't required for those small nonprofit charitable uh, buildings or structures where the, the holding tanks not going to be used for more than 28 days in any calendar year. So that, that is what's being proposed. Okay. And, and uh, I think uh, Commissioner Walk is with us, uh, also Senator Bray. Yep. And uh, you might want to hear you know, their side of, of this sure. issue. Um, before uh, we go before we go yeah. over to um, Commissioner Walk, Senator Rogers had his hand up. And oh, thanks. Thank you, Senator Bray. I, I guess my question would be why we leave that financial surety thing in it all. I know of uh, folks around here that have holding tanks, individual ones, and they certainly don't meet that standard. Uh, I would think it'd be next to impossible to get a bond like that if there's another provision in there that requires them to to have the uh inspection and the uh, contract and and records and all that stuff i'm not sure why we don't just strike the whole section well th there is and brian redman who's on might be better to talk about this but there's opportunity for people to get a holding tank without meeting all the requirements of 1979 generally it's when it's a best fix, when your previous system fails and the best way to address your, your wastewater needs at an existing structure is to the use of a holding tank. And then there are requirements under the rule and the permit that you get for the maintenance and operation of that holding tank. And I don't know if Brian wants to add anything to that. Well, before Ryan could 
yeah. could Ruth get her? Yeah, I was going to say, so Senator Hardy is going to go up. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Starr. Um, I, I'll let Brian answer that question, and then I'll, because mine's on a slightly different topic. So go ahead, Brian. Sure. Actually, uh, Mike, you're you're right on point there. I have nothing else to add. There's a exemption section of the rules uh, that allows us to approve holding tanks as a best fix when uh, full full compliance can't be achieved when responding to a failed wastewater system. So you're you're right on point. Um, I have a question. I don't know if this is for Mr. Redmond or or the commissioner. What's the the? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing. Can someone describe the risk? There was a motivation to have a bond to begin with or financial surety of some sort. So what's the risk we're trying to mitigate through having that kind of financial bond or instrument? Sure, and I'll defer to Mike to the legislative history. I think this is, it's frankly a belt and suspenders at this point. If we require a contract for the pump out, and we have our normal enforcement mechanisms f through any permitting process. The, the, the financial surety piece is, is another way to ensure that that happens from a functional standpoint. It's hard to imagine a system that uh, is not, you know, not living it up to its permit and continue, you know, it, it's essentially a sort of failed system and is continuing to operate and therefore needs the financial surety to maintain operations for 20 years. We're not going to let that system continue to operate in an instance where it's not you know, meeting its compliance obligations. And so it really, it, that, that amount of money is likely to never to come into play. Okay. Um, can we get Rose in now? <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit more background um, about uh, the conversations that I've been having with both um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, Commissioner Walk and his team, and also the uh, Addison County Field Days this summer. Sorry about uh, that. I'll mute. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, I, uh, think he, I don't know why he did it just when you spoke, Ruth, but... Um, uh, anyway, so, uh, um, the field days, uh, as, as, um, Senator Starr said, built this building two years ago, uh, last year, it opened last year. I actually have used the bathroom in this brand new James Foster, um, welcome center. Um, and they installed a tank that, um, may or may not be sufficient size to meet the flow needs. And so they've been working with DEC to measure the flow and try to figure out if the tank is sufficient. Um, we, um, the General Assembly, did pass the provision that, that Michael um, uh, noted um, to allow them to have a tank rather than go to the soil-based um, system for the field days because that was ex uh, really expensive for a five-day event. Um, and then this summer, um, they've been trying to work with DEC to replace the tank or figure out if they do need to replace the tank that they have in there. Um, and as you know, all of the fairs this year were canceled. Um, so they are having even more financial difficulties. So replacing this tank that they already have is quite expensive. And so we are trying to figure out ways to help them be able to do the right thing to replace the tank for, uh, if necessary, based on the recommendations of DEC. Um, and this as, uh, came up as a potential way to help ease the financial burden of making sure that they have a sufficient tank. Um, and it was, um, we had a meeting with all the field days people and all the DEC people to sort of go back through the history of what was, what had occurred. Um, not everybody um, who was, is at DEC now was part of the whole long process. So it was a really helpful meeting. I think we got most people or everybody on the same page as um, a plan and DEC recommended this as a potential um, fix to help assist field days in um, uh, installing a new tank. They will still meet all the requirements. It will just be more financially feasible for them to do so, especially given the hardship this year. And one of the reasons that it's important, if possible, that we do it now rather than wait for the 
for this winter is so that they can get the new tank installed now. Um, there, there was an affair, so we sort of have this window of opportunity for them to be able to move forward with this project <laughs> and have everything in place and up to code and financed by the time we hopefully have another fair next uh, summer. So um, just wanted to provide a little bit more background on that. Um, uh, we met, I believe, uh, Peter earlier, it was in early August, I, it, during the time we had the meeting and it, I felt like it was a really productive meeting and I'm grateful that we are now talking about this and hopefully can move forward with something that will help them finance this new tank. So thank you. So it's the short bit that they're going to save money by not going out and buying a, a bond, paying for a bond, and then they're going to apply the savings there to helping uh, make it a little more affordable to install the larger tank that apparently they need, according to DEC guidelines. Right. And there's still, my understanding is they're still working with DEC to figure out, they're doing the flow measurements to figure out what size precisely they need. Um, I think they had originally hoped that maybe they could afford a full soil based system that would connect all the the bathrooms at the fair and that's possible in the future that would this wouldn't preclude that. But at this point, that's not financially feasible. So they want to make sure that the tank that they do install um, is sufficiently sized and affordable moving forward for the fair. Right. So one last money question. Does anyone know how much their financial surety instrument cost them in the past and how much they're going to save and then how much that helps towards their next upgrade? We, we heard that number uh, back a year or so, a year and a half ago, and it was, it was a lot of money. And I mean, it was up in the, uh, like over the life of it, it was way up in the uh, thousands of dollars. And, but the, the other problem down there is that clay soil uh, if they put an in-ground system in, in the clay, it was, it was going to be rough at their location. And to me, uh, you know, as, as a, a, a person that's interested in doing the right thing and making sure we, we don't cause more problems than, than um, we already have, these tanks would you know, that the effluent would be collected from this tank, taken to a wastewater treatment facility, and it would be taken care of in a proper manner. And with the in-ground system, uh, they could have serious problems in a, in a wet year. And to avoid that problem, it would be seemed to me be better to have have these tanks that where the, we knew the uh, surge was going to go to a treatment facility, but I don't remember the exact number of so the, the, uh, the tank itself. I believe the new, if the larger tank that they may have to purchase, I believe I recall it was around $22,000 for the tank itself. Brian's nodding. So I don't remember the percentage. Um, it's some percentage of that 22000 that they would have to pay every year um, in order to get the surety from the bank. It's essentially an insurance policy that they would have to pay every year. Thanks for that information. Uh, I see Senator Rogers and then Senator Campion. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still having an issue with the whole financial surety language. We don't require people with in-ground systems to have that same sort of insurance and their system could fail just as well as a pump out uh, system could fail. And uh, just make two other points. Um, we don't require municipalities, even those having uh, with CSOs having spills of raw sewage, they don't have to have an insurance bond and financial surety to make sure that they're uh, complying with the standards. I just, I think it's a standard that we don't apply to a whole bunch of other systems. And my only hope is that when they pump out those tanks, it's not going to a wastewater facility that has a CSO and overflow problems. Yeah, that would be bad. Uh, Peter, 
Could you tell us a little more about the uh, bonding and and why anything about the history of that and why you required it, or do you are you proposing to get rid of that that bonding? So I can't speak to the intent of the legislature at the time it was passed. It's not our requirement. You asked, you know, asked us to ensure it was part of the permitting process. Um, we don't, you know, in lots of instances where we there is a financial uh, assurance component, um, we are the holders of that device so that we can make sure that the cleanup of something happens in the instance that. Uh, the work doesn't move forward. That's not the case here. It, from our perspective, it would be cleaner uh, if, it, if this, is, and this is what we originally suggested, and I, everything else Senator Hardy said about our meeting and where we're going is, is true. Uh, we would support striking that entire section of the law to not no longer require the financial surety for any of the tank holders because we don't think it would really come into play as being necessary to ensure that uh, we can uh, have a functioning system and we can use you know both the the contract that's required as part of the permit and our normal uh, compliance and enforcement work to make sure that that you know that there isn't an environmental and public health risk. So just to make sure I'm understanding, Commissioner Walk, are you, are you saying we could strike all of sub two or just at, is that your, is that what you're proposing? Yes. Okay. Um, Senator Campion had his hand up a little while ago. Yeah, no, this, just want to say, this sounds fine to me. Uh, I think Commissioner Walk has answered all of my questions. Uh, it sounds like it's belt and belts and suspenders and, and if something were to go awry, the protections are there, uh, and this this is just holding folks up, um, you know, from from similar to what uh, Senator Hardy was saying, folks are trying to do the right thing. They need a new tank, and to get all this done and make the situation better, it kind of seems seems to make sense. Unless there's something I'm missing, where all of a sudden, you know this bond or whatever we were talking about, this financial security would come back, not being there would come back to haunt us, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. No. So if, I, I feel comfortable. If it would be helpful, we could, Brian could talk about what would happen if the system were out of compliance and what we might uh, require of sort of closing and, and decommissioning the system as a way of saying it, we're not just going to let them operate for 20 years and therefore pay out of that financial surety. We would, you know, so Brian, you want to talk a little bit about that just to sort of wrap up sort of that'd be great back end piece looks like. Sure. Uh, one, one point to be made is we have, we have very, very few of these um, uh, in the state of Vermont. Most of the holding tanks are approved under the exemption sections for the best fixes that I explained earlier. So that's that's one point to be made is there's there's very, very few of these in existence currently. Um, and we don't expect uh, too many out in the future just because some of these uh, threshold eligibility requirements uh, and just the requirements in general are fairly onerous. So they are a deterrent from uh, really going towards a holding tank project. Um, the requirements do, um, uh, through the permitting process require that the owner maintain a waste hauling contract. So we have that uh, belt and suspenders. They require inspection um, by a licensed uh, designer, um, periodic inspection and reporting to the, to the agency. So we feel like there's really some pretty robust requirements already in place that will eliminate the public health and environmental risks associated with the holding tanks. Uh, if a system were to fail, uh, we would investigate the matter and uh, really uh, put a put some mitigating circumstances in place right off the bat to make sure that public health and the environment were being protected uh, and would work with the owner to um, achieve compliance as quickly as possible. These, these projects do take time. Um, so we would be looking at doing mitigating factors. Um, you know, if the risk was too great, that would be a closure. Um, but we would be putting them on a time schedule to remedy the uh, failure as, as quickly as possible, usually within a 15 to 30 day time period. Is there any long term, you know, I, someone used the word decommissioning so, uh, somewhere along the line. 
So say 20 years out, for whatever reason, the, uh, an, an operation just ceases to operate. What happens then? Does DEC concerned about you know just leaving a tank in the ground sort of forever, or does it need to be removed? And if so, is is the responsibility for that kind of step uh, clear somewhere else in law? The the building or structure would require um, a suitable potable water supply and wastewater system for occupancy. Uh, so the issue really becomes is that the building would not be usable until those facilities were available um, for its for its safe use. Um, so that that really becomes the issue is the building isn't it, it do, won't have a potable water supply or a wastewater system. So it would jeopardize the ability to have that building in use. Great. Well, thanks. So <laughs> the commissioner's proposal and, and it's been floated out. I'm, I don't know if he said it first, but the whole idea of removing a section that seems unnecessary seems more attractive to me than sort of jury rigging in a calendar day count, you know, that basically catches up and addresses one situation without naming the situation explicitly. Um, I don't know how others think about it. I, I think at, at this stage of our game that we're in, um, that would be the simplest way to do it is just to extract uh, uh, number two out of uh, that section uh, A. And I think it, we, you know, if both committees agree on this, we might be able to even add it to the uh, budget bill. I've spoken with uh, Chairman Kitchell, Senator Kitchell, uh, in regards to this. Um, and uh, so we might be able to do it as part of the budget bill or an amendment to the budget bill because it, it does uh, pertain to money in a roundabout way. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know of any other vehicle that we that we have where we could address this unless you guys, uh, uh, Chris, if you folks in natural have something to add it to. We do have another bill on the uh, interbasin water bill, but the budget is a sure vehicle to be on. And although it's my preference not to put policy things into the well, sometimes it's a useful place to go. That think, is right. an issue. Uh, especially given how short we are on time at this point, this session. Um, Senator Hardy. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add um, that I would be fine um, uh, getting rid of all of sub two. Um, the reason that I asked Michael to draft it as a sort of narrow exemption was to attempt to get a compromise between our two committees. But if we're all on the same page and all feel that getting rid of that paragraph makes sense. I would, it seemed based on my conversations with DEC and, and Commissioner Walk and his team, it seems like it does make sense that there are other, um, there are other belts and suspenders already in there for um, making sure that these tanks are compliant. So thanks. So one last quick question uh, to our council is, um, I don't know, Mr. O'Grady, if you see if we strike two, are there do anything come? Does anything come to mind from your perspective, <laughs> looking out at it from our uh, sort of a, th that we would want to consider? You know, like are we failing to take anything else into account, or this seems like a surgical edit and we're fine? We have enough other surety built in and enough other ways that eliminating this um, seems like a good solution. Um, uh, um, I'm having like a little domestic issue going on right here. Um, uh, school um, at home is fun, right, Michael? Yeah. So the legislative history of this requirement, I didn't draft the statute that created in 1979, but, um, when, uh, universal jurisdiction went into play, the reason that it was kept was to provide a disincentive for holding tanks. But if you look at this entire section, there's significant disincentive 
throughout um, the section. And I don't think it's going to lead to increased um, permitting uh, underneath the section. Okay. Well, that was, you know, sort of behind my question was once upon a time, it was po a policy expression, like in order to not have development in places that weren't going to allow for an in-ground system, uh, we weren't allowing holding tanks was my impression. It was one way to help guide what kind of development happened. So it doesn't apply here, but. Um, right. um, so there are other questions uh, from other committee members? Let's see. So Senator so, Starr, you're on a pros. Do you want to bring this uh, basically just striking sub two to the appropriations committee directly on behalf of the two committees? Uh, yes, I, I would be more than glad to, to do that. Um, I, I did bring this up to the committee uh, last week that we might want to present this to them uh, once we had this joint meeting and if you folks in, in natural uh, agreed with it, that I'd be back with it. Uh, and hopefully um, tomorrow, it, maybe even late today, we're going to wrap that bill up uh, in a probes. Um, so I'll, I'll bring it to the committee today. Uh, and if they, if they don't, you know, if Jane doesn't want to add this because it is a particular um, committee language uh, jurisdiction. Um, I think maybe a, a letter from your committee would also be helpful. Uh, and if that doesn't happen as a backup to that, if Jane says, well, maybe we shouldn't add it in here, but if you want to do it on the Senate floor, um, we could do it as a joint amendment to the approach bill on the floor uh, from both committees, which is, you know, 10, it's all we need, six other votes to get it done. So, uh, but I don't think this is a, a positive issue. It's not a negative issue we're trying to do. And uh, I would think that, um, you know, it would, it'll go into the bill, but um, I'll, uh, I'll make sure of that today. And if you guys from your committee could send uh, a letter to uh, Jane uh, approving it and, and backing it, that would be most helpful. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing a screen full of faces mostly. I'm guessing everyone's in agreement on both committees yeah. to do it, go bigger. I, right. I am. Okay. Great. And, and, you know, I think you know my concern originally was just that there was the 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 twenty eight day trigger was jury rigged, right? For good reason, narrowly narrowly drafted, not to sweep in more things. But um, it seems like a better a better edit to address the situation broadly, not just you know sort of picking off field days as an exception. All right? Can yeah. I make one comment, Senator Bray? Yeah, Senator Rogers. Well, in my perspective, it's not only a financial burden for someone like the field day, but it sounds like a financial burden for anyone to have to come up with that bond if their best fix is, is, the, is the Holden tank. And like we said, there are tons of other provisions in the law that would, if it fails, it's a failed system. If they don't maintain it and it overflows, it's a failed system. So DEC <laughs> has uh, methods to deal with that. The, you know, my only sort of ongoing concern, I guess we would just have to watch and see and DEC yeah. can help us, which is um, if somehow removing this disincentive made more people say, you know, actually I would like to do this project and I'm gonna propose a holding tank for it rather than so that we might see new projects coming forward. I know there's a best fix. So <coughs> I could ask the commissioner, Mr. Redmond, if, they feel like removing this disincentive might 
end up creating the unintended consequence of people trying to go to new uh, new projects with holding tanks. It, it's still not an easy process, even without <laughs> this. Um, uh, so that was an actual question. I don't know if Commissioner Watt has a response or Mr. Redmond, since you see these kinds of permit applications. Um, yeah, I would de defer to Brian and his team for that answer. Yeah, as I said before, uh, we have very, very few of these uh, permitted under 1979 um, in the state, uh, Addison County being one of maybe two or three in total. Uh, the bulk majority of the uh, holding tanks permitted are best fixes for failed systems under. Uh, so I would not uh, foresee the elimination of the surety resulting in a widespread uh, proliferation of, of holding tank usage for wastewater systems. There's plenty of dis disincentives in place. Uh, we really do uh, look for the soil-based solution in almost all cases um, and try to minimize uh, exposure to pathogens um, through going through the, the soil-based solution. So I, yeah, I would not see this as a, uh, uh, a pathway to proliferation of holding tanks. So yep. to follow Thank up you. Senator Starr, your suggestion, um, if Michael could redraft the language as a, a, a in budget form, then uh, we could send that as part of our committee letter over to Senator Kitchell, and then she would know that the two committees are working hand in hand to get it done. Yeah, that's fine with me. Um, um, is that something you could do, Michael, this morning or before we, we're going to meet uh, right after the Senate floor. So um, if Jane had that um, as early as possible, give her a chance to, to look it over and think about questions. Uh, anything else from anybody? I'd like the Ag Committee to stay on. Uh, are, were you going to have a meeting, Chris? Um, no, we were. Uh, you know, we were. <laughs> we were going to have this meeting after the floor. So we're 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 a step ahead already. Um, okay. So I wanted to check in with Michael. Is that something you'll be able to send to the committee, to, um, like by ten o'clock or something? Yep, I can. Okay, so then let me check with the natural committee. So I'll write a letter between now and then, and once I get it, and I'm guessing everyone, everyone in the committee is fine with sending that over to a probes. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, any anything else from anybody? If not, uh, thank you, Commissioner and Mr. Redmond. Uh, thank you, Michael, and all you committee members. I'd like to have the Ag Committee stay on. We have another issue that we should uh, discuss. So right. thank you, Chris, and yep. natural resources. Thank Thanks you, guys. I really appreciate it, all of thank you. you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Thanks. So, um, golly, if we get this done, won't it be wonderful? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyhow, uh, getting back to a different issue, uh, in the, um, the Ag Agency wanted to uh, be able to redirect funds from, from uh, one fund to another fund and redistribute it. And yesterday, well, I brought this up. To, to Jane last week and not much was said except for, you know, um, you're, always, you're always trying to keep all the money with ag or something to that effect. But anyways, well, yesterday, um, I, I don't recall which agency uh, requests came in, but they wanted the ability to reallocate funds to other areas within their jurisdiction and uh, all, all hell broke loose about doing that. Um, 
in the committee. And the main reason was uh, Jane said that at the end of the day, uh, you know, we've all been given ample, what we felt was ample time or all the different departments were given ample time to get rid of the money and the money is going to be all gone. And what happens, and they were planning on, or she was thinking, or she thinks a year ahead of most of us, I guess, but her thinking has been, and finally told us, was that what if all heck breaks, breaks loose late this fall in, in somewhere, in a school, in the colleges, or in a community, and we need a few million dollars to, to correct that. If we allocate or allow to these different agencies to reallocate the money within their agencies, the money would be all gone and there wouldn't be any money to have in a kitty to be able to put out uh, where these hot spots might show up. So anyways, the, the committee didn't allow that to, to happen. So I, I don't think, I'm gonna bring it back up again today, but I don't think that's gonna, that part of it's gonna uh, be approved by appropriations. And I want you folks to, of course, to understand that. Uh, Ruth? Yeah, I just have a couple questions. Um, I, I'm assuming this is pertaining to that email that we got from Michael last week with the language that was put in from the House side. Is is the about um, the redistribution or or prohib prohibit prohibition of redistribution of funds? Is that is that correct, Bobby and Michael? Yeah, that that got it started. I think going the, the other direction. I think it's just related to the Appropriations Committee's general desire to not have individual agencies reallocating money and to have the money go back to a central fund or a central decision maker to reallocate so that all the CRF money is spent by the December 30th deadline. And is the central decision maker the joint fiscal committee or who is the central decision maker? Um, it's going to depend. Um, the language is being revised in Senate appropriations so that it is more specific and has um, some real detailed guidance on how the money would be spent in any interim. Um, generally, it's going to be joint fiscal, but if joint fiscal um, determines that it's best for it to wait until budget adjustment, it's going to wait till budget adjustment. Okay. Really, they're, they're only going to act when prompt action is required um, in order to spend the money by any deadline uh, and to meet needs, or if there's an extension from Congress, only when that prompt action need, is needed because of time sensitivity or, or I can't remember the other criteria off the top of my head. So if there's an extension from Congress um, on the CRF money, yeah. then theoretically, we could we could take care of it during the budget adjustment in January or February. Yeah. Right. It all depends on how long that extension is. If it's for 30 days, you probably won't be able to get to it in budget adjustment. Uh -huh. But if it was for seven months or a year, then yeah, you could get to it. Okay. And then my second question, sorry, Brian, I know you're waiting to ask a question too, but is I'm, I'm confused, Bobby, what the it seems to me like we the the Senate just got the budget and you're you're finishing it today. Is that what I heard you say? Well, either today or tomorrow morning. Uh, we've been working on it ever since we we've been working on the budget just like the House has been working on it. So the big issues that you're going to be amazed when you see the damn thing. Um, uh, there's very few changes from where what the governor proposed 
and we've gone through all the agencies uh, and their budgets. Uh, you know, we started a week before we all came back. And so we've been working on this since the house has basically been working on it. So it's all we get, had to do is really review review the changes that the house has, has made to the budget. And so there are very few differences um, between what the budget, what the governor proposed, and what the house um, passed. And their vote was a hundred and forty to four or something. I don't know. It was one-sided. Well, I think some of the policy committees, including ours, are you know trying to weigh in, and we haven't seen any of the language. I just the the non-appropriations members of the Senate have not seen the language yet. And so I guess I hope there's time for us all to work through it and yeah. not have it. Well, Senate appropriations has to vote it out by Wednesday in order to meet all the timing requirements in order to get the bill to the governor by September 25th. Got it. Okay. And you, I think you guys should be all getting copies, hopefully, tomorrow evening maybe or, but we're going to have a caucus of the whole and and uh, go through all the all the stuff and the changes so if you look at the house version uh, as they passed it I think that part um, you know will be pretty understandable and and get that uh, um, get that understood and then the only other thing would be the changes that we made to the house proposals so which are are quite limited and there's not too many not too many new additions uh, like what we're proposing a few but not not bad okay i just know that education committee still is discussing some things this afternoon. Oh, yeah you guys came in with a whole truckload of stuff yesterday yeah we got more coming bobby oh god you're gonna have to get a trailer truck <laughs> <laughs> well, um, i got i got some ideas too yeah <laughs> we'll load them on the back of ruth's trailer <laughs> We can put them in the holding tank, Chris. <laughs> yeah, put them in the holding tank. Uh, the other issue uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention, um, over the weekend, um, I got to thinking in regards, you know, <laughs> always thinking. Um, Careful. We, in our public hearings and our testimony that we received from a variety of people, uh, the complaint, uh, a complaint came up or a concern came up in regards to farmers, non-dairy farmers, uh, having to keep, uh, when not being able to get rid of their animals for slaughter uh, because there was, they were all plugged up at the slaughter facilities. And yet they could apply to the ag agency, the farmer could, that he's losing money because uh, he can't sell his beef and he's got to keep them around. So he's losing money with the beef. And at the same time, so we're going to pay them to keep their animals, but we weren't really promoting or doing anything to increase the slaughter capacity uh, to get these animals through. And so I was, I was thinking about doing a, a bill or an amendment to our bill that would, would require the ag agency to pump some money into the slaughter facilities if the slaughter facilities were willing to uh, put additions onto their slaughterhouse, uh, put another line in to, to move more animals through. And the way it all shook out was that I got Michael involved in it and 
Minnesota, I think it was Michael, they put $20 million into upgrading uh, their slaughter facilities to get animals through because they ran into the same situation. So, and they use CRF funds to do it, but the ag agency doesn't think they didn't think they would have time to set up a, a whole separate program, but certainly agreed to allow this to happen under their non-dairy portion. And so I think Michael, we got the numbers uh, from the agency this morning, I believe on what kind of, what they were gonna try to uh, do and promote for the slaughter facilities. Yep, they, they uh, the, as you might remember, slaughterhouses and, and processors were qualified to apply under the non-dairy program and under working lands. And um, the agency is going to um, reach out to the slaughterhouses and um, promote and encourage them to apply underneath that program um, in order to um, uh, get money, um, pay for expenses for increased capacity or any costs that they occurred, incurred uh, due to COVID-19. Um, US Treasury has said that spending money on increased slaughterhouse capacity uh, is a qualified expense if it meets the rest of the requirements of a necessary expense under CRF. Um, and it was Missouri that put 20 million into their, their slaughterhouses. Um, and so it's, it's something that if you want, you could encourage the agency to do um, to get those people to apply to the program. Did uh, Chris had his hand up and then Ruth. So, Chris? so I think this is an important issue. Um, two questions. Are you talking about adding this to the budget where we're already making the tweaks that we've been working on with House Ag? Uh, we haven't got it. The, the, the agency has agreed to do this. They said it's within their jurisdiction to do it without any kind of legislation. But I thought we, of course, I was thinking we were going to be allowed to move some money around and there would be some real dollars there that we could get rid of that would that would really make a difference next year you know the slaughter facilities would have been enlarged and and uh, increased their production so it wouldn't only help fix right now but it would work out so it'd be good for the future but we can't move the money around and and uh, so they can do whatever they can promote this right now with the laws that we have in place. So we haven't got to do anything with legislation. I just wanted to mention it to you that that um, it kind of fell apart, really by not being able to move the money around in the agency because there's gonna be some money left in, I think in the dairy part. Uh, I think we, we were short, we thought we were short in dairy, but yet um, we've still got a couple of hundred or more that haven't even applied yet, so. Well, we were, five of us were right, but that's a little yeah. solid. So um, my question is, the, we did. We are about to give them flexibility to move between programs, and the slaughter facilities are eligible through the working lands stuff, right? Program, am I yeah. right? So, you're just saying we're not going to then have another option in December if the feds extend it. We won't have the chance then to do something exciting. But but until then, we do have some opportunity is that correct well yes we have some opportunities but i don't we aren't going to be allowed to move money from the dairy to non-dairy uh, and and all that so i don't think well, that, really but say more about that be, 
I yeah. thought that was the whole point of what we've been working on with House Ag, and you were putting it in the budget. So is this there? There's a slaughter scene, but there's also now. Are you saying that we're not going to be able to do the the solution we've worked on with Carolyn and everybody? I don't believe it. I know yesterday that got shot down. Uh, the other agency that was trying to do that got shot down, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try again today because they the committee feels that there should be a pot of money sitting there in case we have a something flare up uh, after we've gone home to to take care of it as as of course we're gonna be into. November, all of our dates can get moved to November 15th or whatever. And they already all. have they already have the flexibility to move between, don't they? I they only have the flexibility to move non-dairy to dairy. Right. Yeah, uh, well, so we got we have got to fight for that, Bobby, because yeah. we're not talking about December. We're talking about October. October, exactly. And so it's really a different dynamic than I think perhaps Jane is understanding. Well, uh, we worked really hard to make sure that this money would be uh, would be available in October for farmers that need it. And and I, I just this makes no sense to me. We need to be able to to allow that to happen at least until November 15th. Very least. Hey, Mark, your committee already left. <laughs> well, we're, the dates will get moved to November 15th, so all of October's uh, expenses will be allowed to be in, and then farmers should get their receipts from their sale of milk uh, uh, by November 15th, uh, so that will qualify them to, uh, you know, to get in. The only thing is, after we added in that we would move, we could move money in between them times, and and uh, I don't think I don't think they're gonna buy that. But well, especially who, who, because yeah, it's the approach committee. Well, make them buy it, Bobby. Yeah. Come on, this is why we pay you. <laughs> this is easy. Well, I told you I hadn't given up. Yeah, this is really concerning to me, Bobby. I'm just Especially telling you what we did. This is not. I'm just not telling you what happened yesterday. And but anyways, um, so the as far as helping the slaughter facilities, uh, that that is all uh, in place, and they were going to start working on that, uh, promoting that. Uh, today. Um, um, should should we? I'm happy to reach out to Jane and to Tim. Is there? I mean, there's no reason not to. I, I don't want to step on your oh. toes, but is there a reason not to? Senator no. McDonald, we are way more fun in Senate Ag, but um, our joint committee is over. But we always love having people in our tiny room. Well, I've been out chasing cows, so um, um, this is a good, a good uh, cooling off period. <laughs> um, no, I, it. if you can talk to Tim or anybody, go go for it because all the help I can get, I need. I'll tell you. Um, so, are there, uh, are there any, Bobby? Are there any other situations similar to this in other areas? Meaning, not this agriculture, but other areas where people are trying to hold on to money and move uh, around. Yeah, you aware? yeah, that that's where I got the jive yesterday that it's going to get rough sledding because um, it was a different agency. I don't know if it was Human Services or or one of them that was in uh, with uh, reallocating of funds and and uh, that that didn't go very well. So they wanted to reallocate, but they were told not to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they wanted to reallocate funds within their different areas right. of a jurisdiction that funds were set up for. And, and uh, 
they and we were going to run into a time crunch uh, with the slaughter facilities because ag couldn't set up a program quick enough to just do uh, slaughter people. I'm not understanding what what these are two separate issues, but on the slaughter issue, why don't what's wrong with them just going through working lands? They can, but there isn't going to be enough money there uh, to, you know, it's going to, some of those slaughter facilities, it could take a serious amount of money to put in a whole new line uh, to do slaughter or uh, add on a room to, uh, to do the cuts and, and that. Do they run three shifts usually? No, I don't believe so. I don't think any of them run three. I think some of them run 12, uh, 12 hours shifts there. You know, there isn't a lot of people that like working in those facilities. Yeah. Um, I, I don't understand what the ag agency is going to do. They don't have money for this. So what they're just. Well, they've got 8.6 in working lands to disperse and then They've got uh, in the non-dairy, was there five or six million there? Well, my understanding from the, the testimony we got was that expanding a slaughter facility is a massive project that will not be done by December 30th. So no. I, that's what uh, I- Is Michael, Michael, are you still on? Well, what, what they can do though, like for facilities, like that is they can expend the money. They they can expend the money on coolers, equipment, uh, all these things. As, as long as that money is expended, um, they're okay, even for future uh, usage. That's what Michael dug up uh, yesterday. And, and we passed that on to Steve and, and uh, Abby over, Allison over at the Ag Agency. So is there any other issues uh, that anyone oh. wants to bring up? So it's too late for us to buy Thomas's dairy, right? Boy, that was a shocker to hear that was going down. Yeah. That must have hit hard in the community, right, Brian? It did. There's, I don't know how many employees, 30 or 40, I think. So, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, not very good at all. Um, the only question I had, and I, I guess I'm as disappointed as the other four uh, with the decision here. I, if there isn't another event, where does that money go? It's nice to have a pot of money that's, you know, on a shelf somewhere that you can use, but if it doesn't happen, what happens to it? And how much are we talking about that might be left over from dairy, non-dairy and the forest uh, part? I mean, are we talking millions and millions of dollars or is it a hundred thousand dollars? That's what I'm not clear on. Well, forestry had 1.5, 1.6 left, but they still owed Vita money to do the administering. So say they had they had 20% uh, of their total allotment, say, left over that will go to a kitty. Uh, you know, if we in a million bucks, if if we end up at 20%, it's going to be, you know, we had like 30 million. Uh, I hope the hell it isn't 20%. I don't want $6 million being reverted to the UI fund. And that's where it's going to go? Well, that's where it's going to go is to the UI fund to beef that back up. Uh, so if we keep getting unemployed people, there'll be ample money to, um, you know, to have there. But uh, I, I mean, I would just... I thought that it would be logical if we had 30 million in three programs that we'd be able to move that from one program to the other as long as it stayed within that jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, but 
I know yesterday it didn't go too good, but we'll, when I present ours today, we'll see how it goes. But I just wanted you folks to know that what happened yesterday. Okay. Uh, any, anything else? I don't. I don't think I have have anything else. I just hope, uh, and I hope we get this squared away with the holding tank business and put to rest. Me too. Uh, so your people were all happy, uh, Ruth, uh, with that language uh, on the tank? Well, I mean, I, I think what they would ultimately like is to not have to get a new tank, but... Um, well, that's that's just kind of tough, I think, at this point. At least this makes it more affordable for them to be able to do so. Um, and I think that after all the gymnastics we've gone through, we'll, I will make sure that they understand that they've been taken care of. <laughs> well, you know, they have a seven, I think that was a 7,000 gallon tank they put in last, um, last year with monitors and flow charts and, and all that so but anyways let's work on getting that done and and we'll get this other thing done up uh, anything else michael that you had for us no not right now uh would you want to repeat what we found out about the slaughter facilities you being able to use this money <clears throat> to purchase things as long as uh, they can purchase the things before the end of the year, uh, they're all good to go, right? Right, so the agency for all the applicants um, under dairy and non-dairy have been uh, interpreting the economic harm definition to include the cost caused by COVID and expenses. So for example, um, some of the cheese makers want to go more uh, online and the cost to that. And if they can incur those costs before December 1st, then they're, they're becoming eligible. Same thing with the slaughterhouses. If they can prove some eligibility or, or expenses that, that are eligible underneath the, the CARES Act requirements and incur them before December 1st, then they're they are um, being awarded. So they can um, apply for expansion if it's a necessary expenditure under the CARES Act and the money's um, incurred before December 1. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Michael. Are there any other questions? If not, um, We'll uh, see you guys at 9.30, I guess, on the Senate floor. So, Mr. Chair, uh, are we meeting um, any time the rest of the week? Well, we may be if something comes up that we should meet on. Uh, and if any of you think of any reason why we should meet, uh, you know, let me know and we'll, we'll have a meeting. Okay. I'm just trying to plan, believe it or not, a sine wave in the morning. And uh, I, I didn't want to have a conflict. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, be thinking about you waving. And if we need you, we'll call you on the phone. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have admitted that in uh, while we're live, but I'm an honest guy. Okay, well, thanks a lot, everybody, and we'll see you in just a few minutes on that. Okay, thank you, Brian.